Good morning, everyone. Welcome Hello. to the Chappell Natural Philosophy Society Science Chat for uh, September 8th. Uh, Franklin, who is on vacation for two weeks and uh, to Alaska, and uh, in his honor, I'm wearing a shirt that I got in Alaska when my wife and I took a vacation trip there. And I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to the science chat this morning. Um, we're now recording the meeting, and uh, uh, we would like to uh, um, remind you that uh, we have these weekly meetings, and if you would like to be a speaker and make a presentation of the work that you're working with or associated with or like to share with us, uh, we would be glad to uh, have you do that. Uh, I personally would like you to be organized enough to have a um, something like a PowerPoint presentation or slides or something that we attach on memory. Attach on memory. <laughs> and uh, uh, I can, if you send something like uh, right on the screen, you'll see um, the, there's a PowerPoint behind the scenes, and I can change the. Uh, what you see there um, by uh, moving uh, moving from one slide to the next. I'm going to demonstrate it, but I don't see how to do that right now in a second. But, but anyway, uh, we can do that. We can fix it so you can share that. Or we can share your screen from your PC uh, if you're connected with uh, um, the views um, um, software. Um, okay. What, is there anybody who had made an arrangement to speak today with uh, Franklin? If not, I was going to do uh, a meet and greet and have everyone share something that they're uh, working with. And uh, we had started with some comments by, I guess it was Bob, right? <laughs> you had asked. And we're starting to record now, so we'll do that. Uh, the um, I had mentioned that I'm publishing with uh, Common Sense Science Newsletter as the editor of the newsletter and the editor of the journal Foundations of Science. Um, been publishing a series of articles on the regression of modern science and how all these regressive theories of modern science occurred after what we call the Second Great Awakening, which occurred in America starting in 1840. It was centered in uh, certain uh, churches and also universities like Yale University. And uh, uh, it just spread like wildfire throughout the country. And there was a lot of uh, opposition to it. Uh, and uh, those people who were opposed changed the scientific method to what's called the existential scientific method, and then which removes the role of logic so that you can't prove that anything is true in science. And you don't allow any theory to be falsified because it incorporates a false assumption. It's known by experiment to be false. And so uh, all the theories after 1840, all the major theories in modern science, this is in physics, in chemistry, biology, astronomy, geology, all of those theories are false because they make assumptions that are known to be false. And uh, if you look at the conclusions of those theories, they deny, for instance, the Judeo-Christian scriptures in terms of uh, the origin of the earth and the role of God in society and that sort of thing. And uh, so I, what I'm doing is I'm showing the timeline of the things that occurred in the Second Great Awakening and the timeline of things that occurred in uh, modern science and how all of them are opposed to something like the Bible. And they can only do that. They can only come to conclusions that are opposed because they remove the role of logic. The scientific method was changed a second time in the 1960s to what we call the postmodern 
philosophy of science. And what was happening was people were discovering so many things that were false with these theories that they broke the university up into a multiversity so that we had a separate physics department, a separate astronomy department, a separate geology department, a separate chemistry, a separate uh, uh, biology. You know, all these departments were now separate and they would form separate silos. And those silos were controlled by the leaders of that particular uh, community or discipline. And, uh, and it was not shared. So for instance, to give you an idea, the chemists discovered that gravity was electrodynamic in origin. You won't find it in any physics book. Been known for 50 years <laughs> that, that uh, gravity is electromagnetic in origin. I didn't know that. I never learned a word about it all the way through school, through the PhD and theoretical physics and everything. Never heard a word about it. But when I spoke at the American Physical Society meeting in Washington, D.C., and pointed out what was wrong with relativity theory, according to logic, <laughs> then I was blackballed. I was the head of the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy, wrote a letter to the president of Catholic University, where I was on the staff, and asked that I'd be fired in 24 hours. And if not, all contracts, grants to, you know, to Catholic University would be canceled, and they knew that 27 faculty members in the physics department got their total income from these grants. That doesn't count the chemistry department, the biology department, and the other departments, but just, just in physics alone. And they said they would cancel them throughout the whole university. So the the president talked to the chairman of the physics department and uh, got him to agree that I would be fired. The chairman of the physics department called me into his office, told me what happened, and said, you are officially fired and uh, you are on a blackballed list. You could never work for another university that receives federal funds in the United States. And uh, But unofficially, you're on a salary that you're getting from somewhere else until you can get another job. We don't hate you. We don't. We like you, <laughs> and we're sorry that this all came about. So that was how I learned about it. And uh, so uh, there are a number of people in, in the old NPA that also uh, had the similar experience. And uh, and then some people who have worked with me at University of Virginia in Virginia have been blackballed from the nuclear physics uh, community the uh, divi uh, brand or division there or, and uh, also people at uh, Louisiana at the University of Louisiana who also published a paper with me in nuclear physics uh, they had troubles so uh, and then other people are distancing themselves from me because <laughs> They don't want to lose their job, uh, even though they go to religious schools, but the religious schools have to kowtow to the government and they have to fire these people if they get uh, put on this blacklist. So you see that sort of thing going on. And um, so, yeah, there's some theories that are not correct. And uh, why we let politics and religious ideas uh, our reaction to religious ideas, why do we let them govern the scientific community? And that is it. But it seems to be the case. Does anyone else have anything you'd like to say about that? Bill, this is Pal. Uh huh. I, um, since you don't have the PowerPoint, presentation, I was wondering if you can put uh, your own camera in on the big screen so we can uh, enjoy your personality and uh, features and everything. Oh, God. <laughs> yes, uh, you know. Let's see. 
especially when you are so handsome anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, let me see. I don't know how to... I'm not that familiar with this uh, system. Uh, you probably can see something of me. Let's see. I have a way of sharing my screen. Yeah, we have a very tiny uh, picture of you, like we all do. Uh, if, if I were to put my uh, camera up here, you will see my also in a very small screen uh, photo. But huh. that's not the um, moderator's prerogative. Moderator has the prerogative that he can put his own camera as if it were a part of the PowerPoint. Uh -huh. I think if you stop sharing the slide, it'll probably show your picture. Is that Franklin? Yeah, I haven't left for my uh, cruise yet, but I will be very soon. Okay. Oh, say that again. Uh, uh, stop sharing the slides. Just go into the sharing menu and uh, see if you can close that. There. I saw it. And then we've got your desktop. I think you need to stop sharing your desktop. <laughs> uh, yes. Just uh, stop sharing the big red button at the bottom. Okay, stop sharing. There we go. So now I see pictures of everybody who's got video. Yeah. Yes. Good now. So, um, let me see if I can turn off my second screen here. Hold on. So, pal, if you turn off your video, then Bill will probably become full screen. Sure. Um. No, I think that's his second uh, screen doing it, not my tiny little thing. But I turned it off anyways, so it doesn't make any difference. I think, Bill, your uh, second screen is still not off. That's, um, that's a, yeah, it's a second screen. Hello. Uh, uh, the first is still there. Oh, there. I think this is better. Okay. There we go. There. Is that better? <laughs> oh, sorry. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, I I would wanted to, um, if we didn't have a specific topic to be talked about today, I wanted to do a meet and greet type of meeting where we could get to know one another a little better. And uh, so uh, if we could, maybe uh, if, you, if you agree to that, maybe we could start and I could just uh, uh, ask for people to uh, introduce themselves and tell what their scientific interests are so that we better know them. Is, is that okay with you? Hello. Yes. Yes. So what is this topic? That sounds good. Go. This is, uh, is this Sen Kar Aja? Aja? Who is this? Um, maybe I could get, uh, um, Harry Ricker or uh, Pal uh, to start and introduce themselves and tell us their scientific background and their interest that they have in science so we could uh, get to know them a little better. See, see on, on the conference they're saying past September 2000, but today is 8 September 2000. What is today's topic? Why are you discussing last week's topic? Uh, say that again. I had a little trouble. Last letter. So I have to update the page because this week's topic is different from last week's topic. Got some issues with last uh, last week's discussion. Oh, he wants. Got questions. Yes. Okay, I was not here last week. I was uh, 
taking grandchildren home. <laughs> uh, you talked last week, Bill. I to oh, last week? Okay, maybe I did. Maybe they, maybe you're right. <laughs> Sorry. Bad memory. <laughs> the week before that. I missed I missed a week or two there. Okay, go ahead. If you want to ask some questions, you can. So today is eight separate because last Saturday was one past Saturday on it. Well, why you are you are still keeping last week Saturday's page? I'm having trouble understanding what you're saying. Could did someone get catch it and they could tell me what he said? I'm saying that you know, that today is eight September two thousand eight, but the page you are using it is last Saturday's page. Last Saturday was first September two thousand eight. On the screen you are showing first September two thousand eighteen. That is not today. That is last Saturday. Okay, last Saturday we were talking about. Um, uh, Electrodynamics and the origin of life, I think. Yes. Uh, so um, uh, I didn't cover all the material that I had because the, the, the uh, yes. talk was very long, and uh, so um, uh, it was five hours. <laughs> so I I, I I shortened it, but. Uh, uh, that's something that um, may be of interest. In fact, I had a telephone call just before this meeting started this morning, and a person was uh, wanting to know about uh, in Eastern uh, Asian type uh, medicine, and uh, there's the idea of the body's third eye, which is a, a part of the brain that's kind of like a hollow uh, uh, organ in, within the brain and it uh, can receive uh, information uh, in a manner that's different from the eye or and uh, so the question that this person was asking was what was the type of information and how can we explain that scientifically and uh, the um, you what you have is a hollow organ in the brain at the base of the brain and this organ um, receives something some type of communication and if if the electromagnetic force is indeed the universal force then it would have to be yes. a magnetic signal of some sort. And the question was, was it transverse? Is it longitudinal? And the answer seems to be that the longitudinal radiation requires a capacitor in order to be received and detected. And so if that is the case, then this hollow uh, body in the base of the brain would have to act as a capacitor in some sense in order to receive something. Mm. And the speed of transmission is much higher than the transverse speed of light. So it could go a very large distance in a short period of time. And uh, so there was, uh, this person was asking that I would do further research to see if there might be some basis for uh, this concept, which in America we don't, uh, in our medical profession, they don't acknowledge this type of phenomena going on, but uh, uh, some uh, parties do in America, but not the not the regular scientific community, and uh, so that is a possibility, and, and it could be explored experimentally. Um, and a number of pipe experiments could be done, but we have people we call mystics who uh, seem to be able to be aware of things occurring at great distances on the earth from them, and they're not being communicated with by telephone or uh, radio or TV yeah. 
or anything like that, but they know they have a way of knowing things. And so um, that was a good question. Was uh, how how could they do that, and th does that agree with with uh, uh, good science? Did you want to talk about something like that? Yes. Uh, do you have uh, any information that you would like to share about the, that type of phenomenon? Yeah, I know one thing that all this proves like whether it is gravitation or whether it is magnetism, they are possible only because of ether particles. Uh -huh. So there are, there's a role of magnetism, you're saying. Um, because there are no two pools in nature. That is what Dr. Glenbotcher told me, and I also know the theoretical explanation behind that. Means if there is no ether particles, then neither gravitation nor magnetism will work. Uh -huh. I'm going to try to put on earphones and see if I can hear you better. Because <laughs> I'm having trouble understanding what you're saying, but it could be related to my particular computer I'm using. I'm going to try and see if I can make that work a little better. But I am having some trouble. You can also put your question in the chat. Maybe that might be easier. OK, I'm putting the question in the chat. OK, good. I know. Hey, Nana. Question. Also, uh, if you, Abhishek, if you will uh, speak at a lower speech of rate. Yeah and lower volume, it might help. Your volume is a little too high, and your rate of speech is too high. That's a suggestion to Avishak, who is asking the question. Uh -huh. well, that that may help. <laughs> I mean, every little bit helps. I mean, I'm not saying don't put the questions in the chat, but of course, that's... Uh, a little less interactive. While he's doing that. Uh, hello. Hello. Good. I can start to hear you better now. <laughs> yeah, hello is easier to understand. <laughs> <laughs> I think speaking softly at a lower rate of speech and lower volume will go long ways. Long ways. <laughs> See, you're still too loud. It, it could be the transmission from where he is. Yeah. I think he is, he is from Asia, isn't he? So uh, it may be that there's uh, the transmission line is not the same quality as from some other parts of the world. True. But I think to, to some effect, uh, effect, it's also a cultural thing. And a lot of people um, in that part of the country India, Pakistan, Ceylon, uh, have a habit of speaking culturally a little too fast and a little too loud. Because if they think they don't speak loud enough, they're not communicating. Uh -huh. So they raise their voice to ensure that uh, everybody can uh, agree with them. Not just hear them, but agree with them because uh, you get tired of it, the high volume. Yeah. Well, also, English is not their 
native language so much. Sure. The, their language of government and that sort of thing. So yeah. uh, authority is given by that language. Well, you're very kind. It's nice to give people the benefit of doubt. But you know, I know a lot of people who speak nice and soft and nobody has trouble uh, understanding them. Uh -huh. But there's a percentage um, that may be problem in every country for all I know. So have you seen his question in the chat? No, I haven't. Uh, I see your comment. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying Bill Lucas try a CNPS uh, moderator. Because you have kind of two chats, one as moderator and one as uh, presenter today. Or, or your, in your personal capacity. Because there should be his question in one or the other of the chat. I can't see the, the other chat. So I'm not real familiar with being the moderator. <laughs> so. Uh, well, while we're waiting to try and get something through there, does someone else have a topic they would like to, or, or something they would like to share or a question they'd like to ask? Well, let's go back to um, quantum mechanics um, and uh, the issue of um, um, the interpretation of these of the experiments and the you you made the comment earlier and what was the comment that you made I can't remember exactly the phrase you used what would what was you said well quantum mechanics it was uh, quantum mechanics the uh, the the version in terms of the universal wave function the one we associate with Schrodinger equation and the Dirac equation. Um, yeah, but you had a phrase that you used yeah. to categorize it. There is no such thing as a law of cause and effect. Oh, okay, right. Now, we had, I mean, in science for, for a long time, uh, we had always assumed that there was a relationship. Uh, something caused everything that happens. And uh, so when uh, uh, Newton was trying to figure out you know, how, how the planets went around the sun and the moon around the earth and all that sort of thing. Um, he was looking for a cause and the cause was the force of gravity and also the force of inertia. And so he, he was able to develop mathematical expressions, equations to describe those things because he believed in the law of cause and effect. And so, uh, if, if, uh, if a meteor or an ast asteroid comes through uh, our, our, our solar system uh, and it hits a, a planet or a moon or something like that, the cause of that is the force of gravity. And it wasn't a random uh, thing. Uh, so what is their justification for dispensing with the concept of cause and effect? Because and when you get down to the microscopic level, uh, you you end up with uh, all kinds of things being created and disappearing, created and disappearing. And they give the effect of finite size and the effect of the charge and all those other features of, a, say, an elementary particle like an electron. And uh, uh, the... Uh, the the idea that we have that the electron is like a billiard ball and you can you can do experiments with it and that sort of thing that's based on the law of cause and effect but when you actually do certain experiments it looks like more things are happening than that and that's because the law of cause and effect is is a an approximation it's not a a really valid law uh particularly when you get down to the microscopic basis and 
um, in all the textbooks that I took going through uh, undergraduate physics and graduate school and postdoctoral work and all that kind of thing, um, everywhere uh, we were uh, taught that that's what quantum mechanics says. And, uh, and I didn't, didn't know about the relationship in the timing and uh, everything with the second great awakening that occurred. And I didn't know, um, I hadn't seen the pattern in all the different areas of science. So at that time, I, I've, it's now uh, 40 years later, and I know a little bit more about what's going on uh, through my experiences and uh, uh, in life. And so uh, that, that's where I'm beginning to see that, but we don't teach it like that. Uh, we we teach that uh, uh, you know the the classical views have been replaced with the quantum views, and our uh, theory of standard model of elementary particles is not classical; it's all quantum based, and uh, and you have four four forces: there gravity, electrodynamics, strong interaction, weak interaction, and uh, but that's another thing I pointed out is that the and NIST has made measurements to eight significant figures of the masses of all the 3,500 nuclear isotopes that we have discovered. And uh, now that we have it to eight significant figures, we no longer have any evidence that there is a strong interaction or a weak interaction in the nucleus. We There is a way you can plot the masses of all the uh, nuclear isotopes where you take them with the same atomic number, not the same element, but the same atomic number. And when you plot them, uh, you see you get a parabola. And that parabola tells you that the only force that's going on as you change the number of, say, protons and neutrons or whatever that's in the nucleus, but the total number is still the same, the only difference is the forces between them, and that difference is 1 over r squared. But the strong interaction and the weak interaction are 1 over r cubed and 1 over r to the fifth forces. And there's no evidence for that. In the, in the past, when we only measured them to three or four significant figures, there was a, enough uncertainty that you couldn't tell. But now that we have it to eight significant figures, and this does not make it easy for you to, to notice that the way they put out their data online on the internet. But I have downloaded or copied it by hand, actually, all of the data, all the 3,500 nuclear isotopes, and uh, made plots of them. And you can see uh, what is uh, going on. And you can see that there's only a one over r squared force between whatever it is that's inside the uh, various uh, nuclear isotopes. So, so that's one thing that's missing. And then the, the chemists have found that uh, gravity is really an electromagnetic phenomena. And it's between, gravity is the force between vibrating uh, neutral electric dipoles and quadrupoles and octopoles. And you have those in, uh, in atoms. And uh, so, uh, so you have these these uh, things, and so the force of gravity is no longer uh, a separate force. And the force of inertia, uh, you can also derive and show it's electromagnetic, and it's the force between a charge and a vibrating uh, electric multipole, like a dipole, a quadrupole, an octopole. But it's a charge versus that, not another dipole or uh, multipole. And so anyway, by doing that, um, now if you analyze the uh, forces that occur in our solar system, uh, we discovered with Pioneer 10 and 11 that there's another force that we could not explain in our solar system. And it affects our rockets, and it affects our satellites, and it affects uh, anything that we put out that we can measure accurately. And uh, 
we uh, see that that force uh, can now be explained by an electrodynamic theory of gravity and by electrodynamic theory of the force of inertia. And, uh, but uh, that also explains the structure of spiral galaxies and how the outer arms have too much velocity uh, to be held together by the normal theory of gravity and the normal theory of uh, inertia. And uh, so we invented dark matter and dark energy to, to be the reason for that. Well, if you use the electromagnetic theory of, of uh, gravity and, uh, and inertia, uh, you exactly explain what we observe. And, and not only that, you, know, you explain certain phenomena related to the radiation coming off from galaxies uh, and uh, a lot of astronomical phenomena that we had trouble explaining. And then you also find that Hubble's law, where you uh, associate the red shift with just a Doppler shift of stars, is not valid. That there's not only is there a Doppler shift, there's a gravitational red shift. We've measured the gravitational red shift, and we know all about it. It's been published. It was done first at Princeton University. And, uh, and according to the electrodynamic theory of gravity, gravity is decaying. So when we look out at distant stars, we're seeing uh, the redshift from the distant star that is from the past when gravity was stronger. And so the gravitational redshift is uh, most of it that we see that we associate with Hubble's law is uh, gravitational redshift. And only a small amount is Doppler redshift. And so we see that a lot of the theories of astronomy, the Big Bang and all that are not valid. And uh, so there's, there's a lot uh, uh, going on there. And uh, so many, many theories that we have now, theory of evolution, uh, for instance, the theory of evolution, I think I mentioned this before, if you use a life energy meter, experimental life energy meter, you can measure the amount of life energy in any living thing that we've tried to measure it in. And uh, when you measure it in the experiments that were supposed to have demonstrated the early stages of our atmosphere and the, the beginning of life, uh, we discover that those so-called organic molecules that, had that were the basis for life uh, don't have any life in them. They're dead, just like uh, uh, if I take a leaf and take it off of a tree and just set, set it on the table, the green leaf will turn brown and die. And then when it's dead, there's no life left in it. But it's the same molecules, but they don't have the living vibration of life, which is a longitudinal vibration and related to uh, longitudinal electrodynamics. And so we were able to see that. And the one thing that we have not been able to do in laboratory is to make something that's dead, completely dead, alive. Now, when a person dies, they may stop breathing, their brain may stop running, but the cells are still alive for a certain period of time. So there's some life that you can measure in them, but it declines over time. Just like when I pull the leaf off of the tree, it's dead. It can no longer live, but it, it's green and it does a certain amount of processing of uh, uh, carbon dioxide and stuff like that in the atmosphere. Uh, but it's still dying at the same time. And so, uh, so anyway, there are many things that we have learned. And uh, the problem we have in the scientific community is there's special interest groups that are controlling it, just like in politics. Uh, in the United States, for instance, we see special interest groups trying to control who gets to be elected president and, uh, uh, and the various uh, type of people they get to appoint to the courts, Supreme Court and stuff like that. They want to have the kind that supports their view. And uh, they don't care too much about what the Constitution says. They just care about their political view. And... Uh, so I, I see that sort of thing going on uh, in medicine. I see it going on in science. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's uh, a shame 
that uh, we have let the control of science drift to these parties, which don't, don't really want to know the truth. They want to uh, have their way uh, in, in so some what, uh, You have to have a definition of truth and you have to have a procedure for, for establishing um, a, an operational procedure for verifying that what you claim is the truth meets the requirements for what truth is. And um, it seems to me from what you're saying, um, there really isn't any definition of what is truth in science. And so science can't achieve truth. So they've just decided to decide that uh, they, they're not dealing in truth or reality, they're only dealing in models. Well, you could say that, but uh, uh, Isaac Newton, uh, published his uh, book, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. And in that book, he says, no, that's not true. He says, we don't have final truth in our day, I mean, his day. Um, but he said, there are, there are logical principles that we can follow that will guide us to better and better truth. So um, you're saying that... Um that uh, by the, your use of the term logical principles, you're saying that uh, truth can be defined by following certain sets of logical principles. So we'll That's define right. truth as adhering to a system of logical principles. Right, so one of, the, one of those principles in the scientific method is, if I have a theory that I have based on, let's say four or five assumptions, and we know that some of those assumptions are false, but logically, if I want to derive that theory and have a mathematical law for it that I can test, I have to use some assumptions. And so I choose one I like, and it may not be true, but I like the resulting theory that comes out. So, uh, so anyway, uh, that's what we have done. And, when we went to the existential okay so now uh, so now that we've established that i think the primary example of what you just described is uh, uh special relativity where what they've kind of done is um decided they like the theory for reasons that are not really clear because of the principle of relativity which seems what they call beautiful and elegant but the theory has this uh, logical flaw in it, but it can be accepted because it is in accordance with the experiments. So the theory with is some, correct experiments. Because it's in some experiments. With the experiments, even though it may not be logically consistent or uh, make any sense at all whatsoever to uh, a common sense oriented person. Yeah. Well, see, special relativity only involves the uh, radial and velocity components of matter. And we know that there is no matter that doesn't have acceleration and DADT, where A is acceleration, which is what we call radiation reaction effects. We know that every piece of matter in the universe is experiencing not only the radial and velocity terms, but the acceleration and DADT. Well, the acceleration and DADT are not in special relativity, and they are not both in general relativity. So we know that they are incomplete. And since they involve C, the velocity of light, uh, Henri Poincaré pointed out that uh, uh, they can never be true theories. Okay, but getting back to the point, uh, according, well, you know, it's pretty clear that anybody, well, okay, I guess it's not pretty clear, but uh, to me, it seems pretty clear that special relativity is logically flawed and the experimental evidence supporting it is uh, inconsistent. And, but as long as they can pick and choose the experiments and what they do is they sort of choose those experiments which verify the theory um, then they can say that the theory is proved by experiments and so therefore the theory is true. So basically all they've done is essentially say that 
um, millions and millions of experiments that we have conducted and we've conducted all these experiments and they tell you about the millions and millions of them and it's proven every day, et cetera, et cetera. This is all kind of browbeating you down, um, you know, because uh, you can't question their authority. So you have two issues here. One is you have they're selecting the experiments that verify the theory and ignoring those that don't and they're browbeating you with their authority. Those seem to be the two problems. And the second issue seems to be the one that you um, definitely have a problem with. Yeah, and so for instance, in general relativity, uh, it failed miserably uh, to, uh, to give the forces in our solar system and it failed to give the forces properly in uh, spiral galaxies. So what they did is uh, oh, they, but as long as they're in a position where they can um, change the model by changing the parameters or um, you know well, making additional ad hoc assumptions to fix it up so that it well, meets the uh, experiments, well, they're so they, satisfied with that. Yeah, what they did is they invented dark matter and dark energy, which we have not experimentally been able to confirm. And you would think when if there is such a thing as dark matter and dark energy that we could make it in accelerators, we can make all kinds of particles. So why can't we make dark matter and dark energy? Well, they're busy trying to, I can't, I can't argue that point. Oh yeah, they um, are trying to, because they know that eventually they can be called on the carpet for, for that. If they can well, come up with something. Okay. But if their model fails, why can't they admit that their model fails? Ah, oh, they don't want to. They want to keep that theory. Okay, so you're you're saying that it's more of a social problem than a scientific procedural problem. Well, it could be like, uh, and, and as I was mentioning in this uh, series of papers I'm publishing, it could be that they're reacting to the revivals of the uh, Second Great Awakening, and they don't want religion to become that important in our society. So they're trying to use science to combat religion. And well, that's been true. Um, there's a certain validity in what you're saying because the um, historians of science have, you know, pretty much pointed out that a lot of the um, hostility between the religion and science arose in the 19th century and not um, previously as they would like us to believe. And so they sort of went back and rewrote the history books about Galileo and the Catholic Church to make it uh, comport with their theory that, you know, the new version that you're referring to during the 19th century. And um, I think this has been documented. Um, as to the rationale behind it, I'm not sure that that's really, um, you know, you're just kind of, you know, imp you know, implying that they had a motivation, an anti-religious motivation. Okay, there is a question by Contrary Smithy about what is special about special relativity. Um, special relativity was known by Einstein to be an incomplete theory. And he was always trying to find a more complete theory. And he came up with general relativity. General relativity was supposed to be the relativity, not special relativity. But special relativity is applied and combined with uh, electrodynamics. Now, what I found in the case of electrodynamics is if you use the complete set of the empirical laws, the six empirical laws of uh, electrodynamics, you don't need special relativity because Lenz's law produces all the so called relativistic effects. But if you don't use Lenz's law in Maxwell's equations, you discard it, then you can combine it with special relativity and you get the same result in terms of the, the expressions in electrodynamics in terms of the B squared over C squared type terms and, and then the gamma terms. And uh, so uh, it's, uh, you know, if you, if you follow Newton's advice, you would say, well, you're supposed to use the complete set, not a partial set, because the complete set is the only one that can give you a solution for the, the unknowns that you have. Uh, you're gonna be just making 
approximations if you use a subset of that. And, and, and he said, and if you can solve the complete set and you don't need special relativity anymore, well, discard it. Don't keep it as a separate theory. Uh, and so uh, that, that's what Newton, uh, his uh, uh, advice would be in modern terms uh, for handling special relativity. And then when the chemists find that gravity is electrodynamic in nature, well, you see if, you, if your electrodynamic laws can actually predict the, the force of gravity, which they can, and it can do it better than any other theory of gravity we've ever had, well then discard those theories, discard general relativity, discard uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation because you've, you've improved upon it. You've found a more general form. Hey, and Bill. Yeah. Um, Bob Gray here. Yeah. Um, you're saying an awful lot, which is very exciting to me. Um, by the way, I have not received the updated version of your your book that's still on its way and the reason why i say that is because if i take um anything that you're saying which i am very interested in then i go and try to reproduce it uh so that i can understand it better i i'm really lost as to where to go for example um your electrodynamics Yes, I have your paper and I have a very early version of your book, but it's not laid out sufficient for me to follow every single step slowly. Then you made a, a statement about the chemists have discovered um, what gravity is and stuff. Okay, where do I go to really find step by step, line by line, as well as all the data points, not a summary of the data, but the real data, so that I can go and follow those steps and I can go and, and come to those same conclusions. There's just so far, um, there doesn't seem to be enough published or available or on the internet or someplace where, for example, an undergraduate level science person could go and follow it step by step. There seems to be lots of summaries and for example, the statements that you're making, and I'd love to get my hands on that raw data and reproduce step by step what you're talking about, but it's just not there. Or I haven't found it where to look. Uh, and just going to the scientific literature, of course, that's totally insufficient because those are just summaries. For example, your, your paper on your electrodynamics, very informative, but it's at a summary level not a step-by-step -step level. So I'm wondering if part of the problem uh, with the science is not accepting, um, you know, some of these statements, some of these conclusions, is that there isn't a step-by-step a -step presentation of this at an undergraduate level so that it almost bypasses the quote-unquote experts and gets to the students. And with the students walking into a class or confronting a professor with, look, here it is, step by step, and the data points, and everything together, not just the high-level summary, because the professors can always dismiss the high-level summary. I mean, that's just a statement, and anybody can make a statement. No, no, no. Where's that data in, in every individual step? Yeah. Um, I didn't... Um put in my book the uh, uh, references to the chemical uh, publications. Um, they are um, being uh, withdrawn, I guess you would say, from libraries now under the uh, education framework. Um, now that, that the word has gotten out, uh, every place that has that is now no longer allowed to be seen. And uh, so, uh, so the government, the Department of Education, is trying to preserve the uh, uh, politically correct theories uh, at, at the moment by doing that. Um, but in my book, uh, you should be able to follow the derivations uh, for these things in my book because. 
I do it uh, showing the, trying to show each step of the way. Yeah. But I, I, yeah, as, as I mentioned to you, I have a first edition, and your first edition seems to have had problems with a lot of the equations. A lot of parentheses are missing, etc. So uh -huh. you know, I've I've ordered your most recent version of the book, yeah. and hopefully it will be here very <laughs> soon. Okay. Well, I'm not in the business to sell books to the people here. I mean, I'm not trying to to do that, but uh, uh, I have gone through. I'm I'm preparing for publication the seventh version or edition of that book and it's the universal force volume one and uh um i try to make the derivations um uh, such that uh people can follow it you do have to be have a basis in mathematics of using calculus because we are solving differential equations and uh we are uh you know uh, doing that sort of thing but uh it's not as complex as doing quantum mechanics which has real and imaginary parts to the equation we don't do that it's all real and uh so uh, uh but yeah it's uh um it might be interesting sometime to uh just pass out to our group uh, a particular chapter of my book and to go over it together and and comment on it uh, that might be something uh, that we could do and that would give us uh um you know we'd all see the same equations and the same derivation and people could question how do you get from here to there you know and and that sort of thing and that, you that, you also that mentioned be... yeah i th i think I would love it. I'm not sure others would, but I would love it. You also well, mentioned uh, a lot of data from NIST to the eighth precision, and et cetera, but yeah. you had to copy it by hand and do yeah. something with it. Again, that is either how do you go to NIST? What is that website? Where is that data? What are you copying by hand? Or yeah. can you scan in and upload that data and, and so that I can get my hands on it and yeah. see what you're talking about that oh if you plot it well it's all one over r squared and not one over r cubed or one over yeah. whatever it, it, there's something missing between the end summary statement and the raw data and how you get from point a to point b yeah well i have the uh i've copied all the data down into powerpoint uh, not PowerPoint, a uh, Excel spreadsheet, and uh, so I have it. <laughs> it's a huge spreadsheet, but uh, I could share that with you all. Uh, my the data that NIST has is updated every year as they get better uh, versions of it, or more, even more nuclear isotopes. And uh, so I have it from a few years back, but it was still the eight significant figures, and it was good enough to show what we want to see but uh uh it's if you check out every single data point they probably have updated some of them uh with uh that might be different in the ah. last five or six or last two or three decimal points Our yeah go hi harry uh my question to you would be do you think that the mainstream has done what you're asking do you think that's provided in the standard textbooks no, in the standard no, no, way no, that no. mainstream does no, things. No, no, no. no. I think but they haven't answered this issue either, in your opinion. That's correct. I don't find in the literature the exact data points used to understand what the heck they're talking about. And the textbooks certainly don't have that. They seem to have a very nice cherry picked summary that if you do this particular calculation, you get the quote unquote right answer, but they don't give the raw data before it's all been processed and show how to take the raw data from experiments to get to the final um, the final statement that they say this is the correct answer. Yeah. I don't I don't find that. I just find these summaries and they're a little too high level. They don't start with the raw data or the raw assumptions. They start at a higher level. And it seems well, this is this is one of my pet peeves 
one of my pet peeves is if you get a book on nuclear physics, okay, book on nuclear physics, and it's all theory and nothing about experiments. And um, so you're completely lost as to how, you know, because they don't really deal in experiments or how they actually arrived at what they think is true. They just present this theory that they claim is true because they've verified in an experiments, but they only vaguely refer to the experiments rather right. broadly. And they seem to say, well, this is based on these high energy experiments that we did in these billion dollar accelerators. Yeah, but where's the data from that experiment? You're only telling me that, oh, this is from the experiment. Well, maybe it is or maybe it isn't. Maybe the analysis of that raw data wasn't, you know, just right. Or, you know, I, I just, there's a gap there and it's a very bad gap. Now, I might mention that uh, I'm not the original person to point out this data in the nuclear isotope data. Uh, there was a fellow who was at the Fermi National Accelerator Lab near Chicago and he discovered it. I think he lost his job for pointing it out and he now uh, puts it out of a very unusual website. You can't tell who owns or what organization or anything controls it, but he puts out some of the early data that showed this information. I saw it and I uh, then went to NIST and did the full set of 3,500 uh, nuclear isotopes. And then I did the same type of analysis he did, and I found he was right on. And uh, so I can't claim, and his name is, uh, uh, we can only get uh, his first initial and his last name. Uh, we're doing a lot of research, I got that far, but I don't really know who he is, I don't know where he, lives i think he lives in the chicago area but i don't really know his address i don't know his telephone number or email or anything like that and uh but i uh, i have published papers where i do reference what i do know about him and uh but this is what happens to people when they point these things out they lose their job and then they don't have any more authority they're blackballed in the field and that's what happened to me when I was at Catholic University. And uh, it was interesting. While I was there, I was working, my, my uh, area of expertise was pionic, muonic, and kaonic atoms. And I was using negative pions to um, basically uh, remove inoperable brain tumors. And I worked at Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory. Uh, I had a grant to do that. And uh, I treated 1,000 patients with inoperable brain tumors using a beam of negative pions. Negative pion beam was slowed down, so it was just enough energy to get through the uh, skin and the skull and into the brain. And then we stopped it we had just enough energy so it would stop and replace an electron in an atom. Uh, and uh, it uh, would then be the, the negative pion is so heavy compared to an electron that it goes inside the nucleus, even though it's in the, it's in a, an atomic electron, not a nuclear electron. And when it goes in the side, inside of the nucleus, it causes a nuclear reaction which splits that atom into two pieces, not giving off a whole lot of energy, but some. When you talk to a patient who's having this happen in their head, they said it feels warm, but that's all the sensation that they have. But it's happening on millions of uh, atoms per second. And uh, so what happens is uh, it breaks up the atoms and that breaks up the molecules and that kills the cells that are in the uh, tumor and the body disposes of the, of the debris. And you don't have to use any, any med medications or anything of that sort. And we had 990 
of the 1,000 patients fully recover with no surgery from their inoperable brain tumors using negative pion beams at Los Alamos Scientific Lab. And uh, one of the most successful treatments for those types of brain tumors uh, ever found. Um, but you never hear about it anymore because I've been blackballed for what I said about relativity theory. And I was the principal investigator on that uh, grant. And so no one gets to use it even though it was very successful in terms of the treatment of uh, that type of cancer. And no other treatment of cancer uh, in terms of particles is as effective as pi negative pions. No radiation, x-rays, or other elementary particles can do that the same way. So, yeah. Uh, so I try to put those things in my papers and in my books. Um, that's why I keep coming out with more versions of the book. <laughs> it's because I get more information and I want to put it in and I want you to see it and I get more kinds of experiments. And, uh, uh, and I'm not perfect. Uh, you could probably say, oh, well, I found something you should look at. And, and I have people that have come to me like, I didn't know that Newton gave all these instructions in his uh, uh, book, uh, 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 Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. I had it in my library, and a person came up to me one day and said, you're imperfectly doing what Newton said to do. You should do what Newton said to do. And so I looked, uh, I looked at my book, and I found that, no, I think he was right. And... Uh, uh, and I changed my my approach, and uh, and so I, I did that. And uh, but that's what we need in the scientific community is when someone points out something that's irregular or a better way of doing what we're trying to do, um, we, we should try it. And if it works, we should go with it. And even though it's not original with us, it's original with Newton or someone else. And uh, so that's that's what I have been doing. And uh, and I think that's a, a good way to do it in, in science. And I'm also trying to follow the scientific method that Newton had, which is a combination of the axiomatic method and the, and the empirical scientific method. So with the two combined, you have the combined the role of logic and the role of experiment. And, uh, and that what we have now is we have primarily the empirical scientific method and the existential method. We removed the axiomatic part of the scientific method, which was adopted in Newton's day because they all agreed that was a way to make progress. And that was what enabled Newton to find a force. Well, it looks of to me, Bill, that what they do is they, is they make the experiments fit the theory. Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. You can just do the experiments, just report the experiments that the theory describes and don't report the ones that doesn't. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, yeah. And, and there's a tendency always to point to the data that fits your, your theory. And if you find some data that you can't explain with your theory, if it's a universal theory, you're in trouble because <laughs> it's supposed to explain everything. And so you you uh, just have to keep that on the back burner, hoping you can find a solution for that one day. Because uh, we don't always. Uh, so to get back to quantum mechanics, I thought that the issue with quantum mechanics was determinacy, determinacy versus indeterminacy. And that quantum yeah. mechanics is indeterminate, says that reality is indeterminate. That's right. Yeah, that's why you have the uncertainty principle. And the uncertainty principle says that you can't have a law of cause and effect because you have a certain amount of uncertainty. Well, that would just say that that you don't have that cause and effect is not incorrect. It just says that we don't understand the causes that create the effects. Yeah, you could say that, and uh, and uh, that doesn't seem to be what they're saying. They, what they seem to be saying is that 
nature at the quantum level is inherently indeterministic in that you inherently can't determine what's going on. The, uh, I think the theory of the atom was the key theory that caused quantum mechanics to be accepted and also the um, black body radiation and that sort of thing. And uh, the, um, there was a controversy at the Copenhagen uh, meeting where it was adopted that quantum mechanics would be the replacement for classical mechanics. And the, uh, there were people that felt like there were classical physical type explanations for these phenomena that they were seeing and that they didn't have to go overboard with a, this totally new, new theory based on the universal wave function, they could still have it in terms of things they were more familiar with. And uh, there is a certain parallelism between the electromagnetic theory where everything is created out of the field as solitons and the quantum theory. If you think of the electromagnetic field as the universal wave function, which quantum mechanics doesn't consider it that way, but they both perform a very similar function. But the difference is the universal wave function is not something we really know. Whereas the, uh, we think we know more about the, uh, the electromagnetic field than we do. We feel like the electromagnetic field is something physical that we can observe, we can measure, and that sort of thing, but we can't do the same thing uh, to the same extent with the universal wave function. We can perform an experiment and get a value for one measurement, but uh, we can't monitor it continuously because we have the uncertainty principle and all that kind of stuff that are affecting us. Whereas we think we can monitor more continuously the electromagnetic field. So, so are you saying that the electromagnetic field is continuous and not discrete, or I'm not sure I follow exactly? The, the, I mean, me, the issue, as I understand it, I mean, to, this would be my view of it. The issue is the topography or the topology of the field, um, if we call it the electromagnetic field, is it continuous or is it discrete? Do we have waves or do we have particles? Okay, the answer to that was found by Hooper at the University of California at Berkeley. And he measured um, 13 or 14 properties of fields. And one of the properties is that they have a tensile strength. That means fields cannot be cut. And that is a very interesting property. And uh, from ancient times, this atomistic idea of uncuttable was uh, introduced in terms of the uh, uh, first ideas that uh, monads made up all uh, size of matter. In other words, well, now you're talking about the discrete topology versus the continuous topology. Right, but the monad has now been found in the laboratory by Winston Bostick, and he found that uh, it is a soliton. There is what we call charge does not exist. Charge is a mathematical approximation for the effect of a soliton. And a soliton uh, is the building block of all elementary particles. Well, and, my view on this is that what you have is you have something called a particle called the electron that produces a field. Okay, that's the usual way of talking about it. But how do you separate this so-called particle, this electron, from the field? They're inseparable. I think that's what you're saying. No, I'm saying that the field exists even when you have no particles. Well, it's kind of like I can talk about um, monads or solitons in water. I can have a pool of water with no solitons. And then I can make a soliton by pushing a plate back and forth in the water. 
And that soliton has properties like mass and other properties uh, that we uh, and charge and stuff like that that we might associate with an electron, but those are merely approximations. Now, when when I derive the force of gravity and the force of inertia from electrodynamics, guess what? I get a formula like for F equals MA, I get a formula for, for the force between a charge and a vibrating dipole, let's say. There's no mass in there. It's only a, a charge. So now I can define charge and the frequency of vibration and the amplitude of vibration. I can define mass in terms of those quantities. And yeah, but I, you just told me that charge doesn't exist. It's a well, mathematical well, that's what we're, That's what we use in electrodynamics. See, electrodynamic equations also have mathematical approximations. It's not just F equals MA where they don't know what mass is. In fact, if you would ask Newton what is mass or Einstein, his answer was, I don't really know. All right. Well, let's get back to, I mean, I view, my belief is that charge doesn't exist. It's a, it's a um, um, artifact of our understanding and the way we talk about things. Um, you know, to say that an electron is charged is, in my opinion, somewhat uh, a misstatement of the words. Um, Charge is a thing that results from the existence of the electron. The electron doesn't have charge. Charge derives from the existence of the electron. Yeah, well, see, the, the, the electron is a structure in the field, and that structure makes a, ha, extends to large distances, and the, the tensile strength of the field causes <clears throat> that structure to make a one over r squared force between field lines and so you see something that looks like charge over r squared or some kind of constant and we just call that constant charge and uh <clears throat> but we don't really know what charge is <clears throat> until winston bostick showed that he was able to make solitons out of the field with no charges. So he made what we call a soliton without putting any charge in it. But when we measure the fields of the soliton, we say, oh, it's the same as if it had a charge going in a ring. You know, the same value. But we, we, know that there isn't any such thing there but mathematically we can approximate it that way in other words we're using we're we're, we're naming a structure called the soliton we're calling that a charge and we're saying that there's a certain field that comes off of that charge but what it is is that's the change the soliton has changed the is, is a structure in the field and it doesn't have anything called charge but it it mathematically can be approximated as if you had a charge. All right, Bill, I'm I'm starting to sort of understand a little bit about what you're saying, but the terminology I think is a little daunting. Um, to me, um, what you have is the idea of the discrete in topology, and then you have the continuous, and the principle in topology is separability. And I think you're saying that the field is not separable because yeah. you can't cut it yeah and um that then you have the discrete which is something that you can separate or cut would that seem to be reasonable yeah. logical yeah. approach yeah. the issue yeah. as i see it is how do you explain the you know they call it wave particle duality or the um you know the, the problem is what came first, the field or the particle? So, you know, you can talk about the particle and, you know, you can describe laws for the particle, but you also need to have laws about the field and somehow you have to bring those two together. And that seems to be the problem with physics is they don't really have a way of bringing the particle and the field concept together. 
Oh, we do. Fart, we do have a way of doing that. Farting. Win, uh, the um, Winston Bostick's mentor was Arthur Compton, and Arthur Compton measured the wavelength of the electron. And so now you ask the question, well, is the electron a wave or is it a particle? He measured the wavelength. Well, what is the wavelength of the electron? Well, Winston Bostick found that when he made the soliton in the field, that the circumference of the soliton, the, the main part of it, was the wavelength of the electron and that there's a wave in that uh, so, soliton. And that uh, when you have uh, electrons in an atom, you know, outside the nucleus, those electrons uh, have different waves in their toroidal rings. They're not orbiting the nucleus. The finite sizeness of the electron and its uh, circumference in that toroidal ring determines the frequencies and the change in energy that you can have. So you can have a, uh, a wavelength in the electron. Well, but Bill, and according to mainstream physics, the wave is only a wave of probability. It's not really a wave. It's just a, a, a probability of the, the particle, the discrete thing called the particle will exist in a certain place. So yeah, there really yeah, isn't but an that's actual a quantum, wave. But that's it, a quantum it, idea. But when, in the Copenhagen meeting in 1927, when uh, quantum mechanics was adopted, there were a number of people who objected because uh, they saw that the physical particle could have wave properties physically. And so when, when Winston Bostick found the physical soliton in the field, that's a toroidal ring, and he found that it had a wavelength in it, and that wavelength could change if you accelerate the soliton, like you accelerate a, uh, an electron, what happens? The mass increases. Uh, what happens in the case of the uh, wavelength of the uh, electron? The higher the mass, the shorter the wavelength. So it shrinks in diameter or circumference. And so what you find is if you have a physical model of the soliton, that you can explain all the quantum effects, including diffraction and all this type of stuff. It all is can be explained physically without any quantum ideas. And all but you have to give up the idea of the separate particle or the point particle concept. That's, that's my right. understanding. You can't, you can't have a particle completely independent of its environment. In well, words, I agree with that. I think that's the part of the mistake. And that is that um, when they do these experiments and they say, OK, I'm send, I'm shooting this particle out. Well, you know, and you're supposed to think of that as this localized object, this particle thing. But it's really more than that. It's got a field associated with it. And um, yeah, so there's more than just this particle. Um, so that's a pretty limited model in my view. Yeah. But that's the model that they're using. Let me contrast for you the view of the second great awakening on this versus this scientific view. The second great awakening, which is based on the Bible, uh, has God as the creator of the universe. And how does God act? He always acts in an electrodynamic fashion. Whenever we see something that can be associated with God, whether it's uh, Moses speaking to the burning bush, which doesn't burn because it's not a fire. Well, Bill, let me let me just ask you: Does this have anything to do with the concept of the of divine as being light? No, is that what you're referring to the electromagnetic field. In other words, the electromagnetic field, according to the Bible, is emanating from God. God is the source, 
Okay, so God, God is, and that, and usually in the in the pictures you see this radiation, this um, halo surrounding the divine, yeah. right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. And the Bible All right. talks about that in the book of Habakkuk. But okay. anyway, gotcha. Uh, so what what the idea here is that this is coming from Winston Bostick, who I don't think was particularly religious, but but anyway, it's his his experiments that enable us to see this. Um, the idea is that by disturbing the field, and the field is continuous, so it's kind of like a, if I have a rope and it's coming out from me and I wiggle it, I can make a wiggle that goes down anywhere that I want that the rope goes. And so these field lines that are coming out from God, he can cause uh, solitons to appear and he can make matter. And But the Bible says that God is not only the creator of the universe, but he is the sustainer. That means he is maintaining it. So he is still keeping some control. And that can be done through the field because we know the field has tensile strength and you cannot completely cut it. And uh, so that means that uh, there's this uh, control that's always there. They wanted to get rid of that idea. And so the, the idea of quantum mechanics would enable you to say that science says, no, that model's not right. Uh, the, the universal wave function is the thing that's everywhere. And, uh, and it's controlled by uh, statistics and, uh, you know, uh, not by God or someone like that. And, and natural. All right. I, I, I understand better is there now. Any chance, is there any chance that you and, and Harry could take a break and, and read what's going on in the chat? Okay, because let's do that. There's, okay. there's conversations going on in the chat on the side, and everybody here is listening to you two go back and forth together so quickly okay. that no one else is conversing here. Okay. You want? Would you like to read some of the comments, and we can comment on them in order? Well, they should be readable to you. Okay. But, but no, but nobody is talking in this conversation because it's going back and forth so quickly that there's there's no other in moment for anybody else to introduce. So I'm okay, rudely right. interrupting let's, here. So I'll step do, out of the see. side and, and maybe oh, try to quite a few slow comments. down and see what's going on. <laughs> okay. This well, first of all, they talk about publishing things at Vixra. Uh, Dot org and there's a lot of things published there but there are no standards for publication particularly so there's a lot of different things that that go there that wouldn't be normally accepted uh, in a journal because it doesn't follow the scientific method if you want to talk about it that way um, Let's see, there's something here that says several field excitations have so little effect that they cannot be detected in isolation, but in huge numbers they cause a noticeable effect. An important one is the spherical pulse response that is a solution of the wave equation. If temporarily locally deformed, deforms the field and it persistently expands the field. So what they're talking about is what type of waves can you have in the field? You can have solitons, which are semi-permanent, or you can have um, uh, in not permanent but uh, temporary waves. And uh, uh, just like a, a sound wave is a temporary wave, and it goes out and eventually dies out, and you can't hear it anymore. But you know, and then light is uh, white light waves are stronger than sound waves, and so light waves can go um, a distance between stars, and you still have it, um, but it's not a, it's not a, it's just a uh, what do you say a uh, a temporary uh, change in the in the field that causes what we call light and temporary excitation in the field, and uh, just like I can have a rope and I can wiggle it and that wiggle will go down the rope. And uh, 
the same thing can happen in the electromagnetic field because it has tensile strength. If the rope did not have tensile strength, you couldn't get a wave to go down the rope. And the fact okay. that light goes anywhere is a evidence that that light that the field has tensile strength. Yeah, I think Hans made that comment. I don't know if he's listening at this point or not. Uh -huh. I don't know if you could clarify what he was talking about. Yes, um, the wave equation has more solutions than just waves. And um, if you look at the wave equation and its solutions, then you find uh, oh, one-dimensional and uh, three-dimensional shock waves. Call you later. Uh, shock fronts, in fact, then they are no waves. They they, uh, they move as a front and not as a wave. And what do you these, mean by wave? A, a wave is something that's per periodically. And a okay, shock front... So I've, and I've, a, my definition of a wave is something that satisfies the wave equation. Yeah, but there are more solutions than, wave, uh, than waves. Then if what you, look, you mean is sinusoidal variations? Yeah, yeah, but but it has more solutions. That far okay, more. We, under, I, we understand that. I understand. That. I don't know if any other people do or not. Good. What What are some of the other types of uh, uh, waves that uh, you want? That they they are with? they are very tiny solutions. They can uh, be uh, affected by by a point like a trigger. And then they become so tiny that the effect cannot be measured by any machine. And uh, these are shock fronts that can be in one dimension and in three dimensions. Huygens uh, has already uh, studied these things, and they are known since two and a half centuries. But most physicists uh, have no interest in them because they cannot be measured. They, there is no way to ever uh, measure these things, but in, in enormous numbers, they uh, can cause a measurable effect. And this happens, for example, in elementary particles. Elementary particles are completely constituted by these uh, shock fronts, spherical shock fronts. Okay, so now you're talking about a particular uh, approach to elementary particles, is that right? That, that that uses these to uh, explain some of the properties of elementary particles. Yeah, because right. uh, uh, then only in that case, an elementary particle can be at the same time a, a particle and point-like, and it can uh, have wave uh, uh, aspects because the distribution of these uh, pulses the uh, is... Uh, Characterized by uh, uh, a characteristic function that is the Fourier transform of the distribution. So it it is a wave package. Okay. Uh, Hans, what I if want I, to if I can answer the question, here. Hans. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it basically, Hans. W one thing that confuses me was you say it's one dimensional, and then you turn around and say spherical because the two doesn't. Don't seem to make sense to me. No, 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 no. no. Three dimensions. That, they are two different solutions. There is the one dimensional solution, uh, shock front, and there is a three dimensional one, and that's spherical. I, I don't understand how anything can exist in one dimension, actually. Well, uh, in fact, the photons are uh, strings of these uh, one dimensional shock fronts. That's why a photon can have a frequency because they are equidistant, uh, gathered in, in a photon. A photon is not a wave; it's a particle. It's a string. It has a, a it has a distinct length. Okay, Hans. Um, we have a uh, two points of view here. Uh, you are following some uh, string theory ideas for the. Uh, no, 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 no. This has nothing to do with string theory. Okay. Um, it, uh, it are the solutions, solutions of, of uh, the wave equation as it stands already for two centuries. Okay, but now the it wave equation... It is discovered by, by D'Alembert and by Huygens. Yeah. You can look there. Right. The wave equation that you're talking about, is that from uh, electrodynamics? No. It is uh, uh, for any field. 
electrodynamics is one kind of field, and uh, our living space is also a field. It's another kind of field. And the, okay. bo both these fields can show wave behavior and can have these shock fronts. Okay. Well, the, the, the I think, response I, think, I would Bill, make, you just have a single field, right? Uh, I have, I have the work I have done because I have shown that the stronger interaction force does not exist, and the weak interaction force does not exist, and the force of gravity is electrodynamic. I, it seems to have the conclusion okay. Okay. that there is only one force in nature, which is electrodynamic, and the field is the the uh, controlling basic thing that's in that uh, view. So I guess the problem that I have with what you're saying is that um, I have what looks like a universal solution to this, and I'm able to explain the properties of elementary particles better than any previous model of elementary particles with just electrodynamics alone and, and solitons. And there's only one kind of soliton or two kinds. There's a soliton and anti-soliton. And uh, they, uh, uh, so the, I guess the question is, uh, you have an idea which works for some things that you want to apply it to, um, but will it, mesh with everything else that we have and uh and the problem is that logic says that uh electrodynamics is the only force in nature and the uh equation what what kind of logic says that there is only uh, electrodynamics as a field because there can be more there can be more than one field and because uh, there's no there are. There's no evidence for it. All the evidence now points to electric gravitation. Gravitation is, in its behavior, a completely different field than the electrodynamics field. Electrodynamics, electrodynamics the can, can attract multipoles can produce all the known data for gravity. All no, the known it's, data. It's field theory. Including dark matter and dark energy. All of that can be explained no. simply from electrodynamics. You don't have any dark matter and dark energy. You not, not, not all the phenomena, and you don't have any adjustable constants. It, uh, the problem is that there is a, a general field theory that works for both fields, and the field equations are exactly the same. Only but these that fields... field theory is based on quantum mechanics. No, no, no. The field theory is based on quaternionic uh, algebra and quaternionic mathematics. The, there is a, a quaternionic differential calculus that uh, uh, features all the uh, Maxwell-like equations and more. Yeah, quaternions is what uh, Maxwell started with, and what basically no, we not yeah, yeah, but but then a similar solution. But he has he he only started with uh, equations that he could derive from uh, experiments. If you take a ma mathematicians and set them at work at uh, quaternionic differential equations, he comes up with more equations. Right. There's a complete set of, of uh, quaternionic differential but, equations but you have that is problem. wider. You have a problem. Your scientific method that allows you to do that will not allow you to falsify your theory uh, because I, your assumptions I are hate problem. I hate any scientific method because mathematics is science. And uh, uh, for some people, that don't uh, are not very skilled in mathematics, I think, uh, have found discovered something like a scientific method, and claims that uh, mathematics alone cannot be any science. That's stupidity. Yeah, I agree with you on that. But but in mathematics, you always have axioms, and you use that to make your mathematical theories, and those axioms have to be true. And logic enables you to determine whether they are true, and that's if where you, the problem you, is. You can start. You can start with a very small uh, set of axioms, about twenty-five, and derive the whole uh, system from that uh, foundation. And then you come via quaternionic uh, Hilbert spaces 
you come to quaternionic field theory. But those 25 axioms are many are known not to be true. They are, uh, do, do you believe, do you believe in classical logic? I believe in, in uh, the axiomatic method, which is, you could say it's classical. It goes all the way do you, back to, do to you the believe, Greeks and, and no, the answer, answer yes or no. Do you believe in classical logic? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by classical logic. Uh, I, about the classical logic that is, is uh, a lattice structure uh, the, about uh, uh, logic propositions uh, in which you can uh, keep uh, things correct. If you start with truth, you keep things uh, uh, going with truth. And these 25 uh, axioms of classical logic uh, define how you can uh, uh, make a logical theory. And there is a I similar... Well, and there's a similar lattice that is called quantum logic, and that uh, lattice uh, is uh, the, the foundations of, of uh, Hilbert spaces, and I think it's also the foundation of uh, quantum uh, theory and all those things. Okay, there is a I think we're way too deep to, into the same situation answer this we were in before, but you just have two different people. Yeah, the 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 there was a fellow named Henri Poincaré. And he developed a field of nat natural philosophy called meta theory. And it's the logical theory of theories. And he has derived a number of theorems. And these theorems show that these approaches are not valid. And I tried to use some in my talk so you could get an idea of, for doing electrodynamics, for instance, you could get an idea of what was wrong with them and uh, uh, but uh, this has been such a problem for the scientific community the people controlling it that they have outlawed your even being able to get a copy of any book he has written on this meta theory now you can get the other books he's written but not the ones on meta theory but some of those books refer to the theorems that were proved in the meta theory that all theories in natural philosophy including mathematics have to obey and they it don't has, want you to know that it has a, a perfectly well uh, supported uh, uh, documentation in mathematics and it's called classical logic and uh, similar uh, uh, Garrett Birkhoff was an expert in uh, classic in, in lattice theory also in, in the classical logic. And uh, together with John von Neumann, he discovered the um, another lattice, which, which was called by them uh, quantum logic. But it is not a logic, it is uh, a, 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 a lattice structure. But that, that um, uh, lattice structure emerges into a Hilbert space, a separable Hilbert space. And uh, it grows further on into a very complicated structure that uh, is quantum mechanics. Yes, I, I, I think we need to look uh, more carefully at that. That, that would be a, a good uh, possible uh, uh, presentation to do. And uh, uh, I, I think he's given that presentation before, um, Bill. Uh huh. I don't know whether it's in the recordings or not. Uh huh. The um, uh, uh, all of the work of quantum mechanics has been disproved by Poincaré, <laughs> and he also disproved the version of electrodynamics we're using. He disproved the special relativity and general relativity. Uh, showed that they were not valid, uh, and. Uh, from uh, logic, so it'd be interesting to see if we could uh, the, apply that to the, the two, the two lattices, the two lattices, the classical logic uh, lattice, and the other is called orthomodular lattice by the mathematicians. The two lattices um, differ in only three axioms. They both uh, both are existing lattices, and if you you can mathematically prove 
that uh, these uh, automodular lattice emerges into a separable helper space. That, that's a, a proven fact. In fact, it was proven already in the paper of uh, Ger Gerrit Burkhoff and John von Neumann when they introduced the quantum logic in, in 1936. Yes. And he tried to do that after Poincaré died because Poincaré dominated all of Europe at the time with his logic. Yeah, yeah. Poincaré couldn't, couldn't defend himself. But it, well, well, in fact, that they, they both uh, structures have uh, validity. The uh, classical logic has validity in proving logical statements. And the um, orthomodular letters is, uh, um, has validity because it emerges into the Hilbert space. And the Hilbert space is used by most physicists to, uh, uh, to do their uh, uh, quantum right. physics in it. Okay, now you need to know something which maybe you don't know or not. For the postmodern philosophy of science was created to allow these theories to exist in physics. And, uh, and that's why they divided up into various silos. And uh, they wanted to keep them separate. And they also wanted to keep the work of Poincaré in a separate silo from the others because his applied to all the silos and they didn't want that and so they uh they they set up the postmodern philosophy of science well, well my uh, question we're, we're drawing near the end my yeah. question for hans would be this which is um um based on what i see when you read a book or you hear you know you go on youtube and they give you you know, an explanation of how quantum mechanics works. None of it uh, refers to the uh, work of von Neumann and uh, Birkhoff. Um, it just seems, you know, you hear about uncertainty principle and, you know, no cause and effect and things that we talked about earlier. Uh, what is your explanation for that? Well, uh, some, sometimes, not very often, it's uh, touched again and one of the, the promoters of, of this, uh, these ideas of uh, von Neumann and Birkhoff is John Bates, uh, an English mathematician. And he's written some very uh, good mathematical uh, papers on this. And he proves mathematically exactly uh, how the, the tree, how, how these uh, the, this orthomodal letters it develops into uh, separable helper spaces and things like that. And, and he also proves a lot of things that you can and cannot do with uh, separable helper spaces. So that, and, and he is still living. He is still, still uh, 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 vibrant. He has the uh, category, the, 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 the category club, I think he calls it. But you can, you can uh, uh, Google for him and read his uh, uh, article or you can google for for my my uh, papers i uh, very often refer to him because he gives me my basis for my theories it is uh, i i put it in the check the check box john 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 bayas john Hey, um, last well, we've, uh, we've reached the end of the time yeah. there, Bill. Right. We're going to have to, to close. My wife actually is has car trouble and needs to be rescued. Oh, no. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, this has been an interesting discussion. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, last week I or one week when I talked, I gave a, a started with a picture of the book, The Trouble with Physics. And it goes into some of the problems in these areas that we've been talking about. And uh, uh, that might be an interesting book to, uh, to look at to see what it has to say about some of these issues. But uh, 
And we've Phil, had. I, I uh, want to thank you for your presentation. I, um, I apologize for interrupting earlier. It just seemed like it was, you know, a two-way conversation. I was hoping to get more of the group involved. Yes, thank I'd you. Like, for your, I would, for would your like to have for your help. more of the meet and greet to find out what more of us are looking at doing. So we need to to share a little bit, and uh, so maybe next week I will be in charge next week because uh, Franklin will still be on uh, holiday, and uh, then uh, we can. Uh, uh, have well, Bill, um, one of the things that you said just before we, Cornelius interrupted, which I thought was um, pretty good, where you were talking about your view of God and how God relates to physics. And uh, I thought that was very uh, helpful in understanding your view. So I thank you for that. You might want to think about, um, you know, talking about that in a little more detail. Well, I think it's important if you're going to understand the reaction of the scientific community to the Second Great Awakening, you can see why they're moving off in certain directions uh, because they, they can support certain ideas uh, by, by changing the scientific method and doing that sort of thing. And uh, so um, uh, it 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 uh, kind of shows up there and it seems to be circumstantial evidence but uh i don't know if it really is valid because uh, i didn't talk to these people who did this work i know that uh the fellow who did evolution his father was a minister and his son <laughs> didn't like the religion and so he he pursued evolution uh uh, and uh, so, but I don't think that was necessarily the case for everybody. I think it was just that one case, but you don't know. Okay, well, we're going to have to bring this to a close, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. And uh, I hope that uh, um, we uh, can uh, let me get back here. <laughs> Don't forget to uh, stop the recording. Yes, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Hold on. <laughs> I know there's a, a menu here that will give it to me. Okay, here we go. Stop recording. Oh, this is